Hey there everybody, I'm Joe's Disney Guy and welcome to another Disney Guy Review. Today we're going to be taking a look at the black sheep of the Disney Renaissance, but still a revolutionary film nonetheless. It's time that we dive into The Rescuers Down Under. Back in 1977, Disney released The Rescuers, an animated film based off the book series by Marjorie Sharp that followed the story of Rescue Aid Society members Bernard and Bianca as they attempted to rescue a little girl from a maniacal pawn shop owner in the bayous of Louisiana. The film was a huge critical and, more importantly, financial success during an era when Disney was really hurting for one. And of course, you can learn all about The Rescuers by checking out my video on the topic right here. Fast forward to 1989 and Disney struck gold again, this time with The Little Mermaid. The Under the Sea musical reinvigorated the Disney studio, and off of the back of the massive success, there was a desire to start making more animated films more efficiently, due in large part to a promise made by the Disney studio heads, Michael Eisner, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and Peter Schneider, to release one Disney animated film per year. It was also around this time that computer animation began to be explored more at the studio, with CGI elements appearing more and more frequently in Disney films since The Black Cauldron in 1986. Of course, it was a pretty convenient time to start experimenting with computer animation, because at this time, animated movies still took quite a while to make, but with the movie per year mandate from the studio, it was pretty much a necessity to try to figure out how to cut down production time dramatically. And with the desire for more animated films, more ideas were needed to make into animated films, leading to the advent of the rapid-fire pitch meetings known as the Gong Show meetings. An idea that came up in one of these meetings that piqued the interest of Jeffrey Katzenberg was, quote, a sequel to The Rescuers set in Australia. Due to the success of films such as Crocodile Dundee, there was a bit of an explosion in the popularity of Australia and its culture among Americans, and Disney wanted to get in on the action. And a sequel, something that Disney had never done before for The Rescuers, a movie that, though successful, wouldn't exactly be considered one of Disney's most memorable, might seem a little bit odd. But you have to remember, this was a time period where Disney was trying out some new things, and also, it was a chance to cash in on an existing property in an age when home video was starting to phase out the concept of re-releases. But despite the allure of a sequel, there were actually plans to extend the Rescuers franchise in a television show for the newly minted Disney Channel. But that show would be reworked into Chippendale Rescue Rangers, freeing up the Rescuers to take part in the first sequel in Disney animated history, which was greenlit in 1986. From the beginning, there was a desire to make sure that this Rescuer sequel not only felt different from the original film it was continuing, but different from nearly every previous Disney movie as well. Early on in development, the decision was made to eliminate songs from the feature, even though the original Rescuers featured an Academy Award nominated song in Someone's Waiting For You. The decision was made due to a desire to keep the pace of the plot and the action moving, and because of this, The Rescuers Down Under was touted by Katzenberg as Disney Animation's first action-adventure film. Alright, first off, I have to take some exception to calling The Rescuers Down Under the first action-adventure movie in the Disney Animated lineup. There have been plenty of movies in the past, Hunter on Dalmatians, Robin Hood, The Great Mouse Detective, etc., that could easily slide into that genre, even if they did include a little bit of singing. And second, the decision to remove all songs from The Rescuers Down Under made it only the second Disney animated movie ever to not have any songs in it. The first? The Black Cauldron, which... Yeah, it might not exactly be the movie that you want yourself compared to. The directors on The Rescuers Down Under also contributed to try to set the movie apart, once the selection of directors was actually settled. Following his work on Oliver and Company, where he was a writer, character designer and supervising animator Mike Gabriel was approached by Peter Schneider about potentially directing, but declined the offer, citing that the position just didn't look like a lot of fun. But a few months later, when Schneider again offered Gabriel a director's role, this time attached to The Rescuers Down Under, he accepted. Soon after, Hendel Butoy, who had worked closely with Gabriel as a supervising animator for Tito on Oliver and Company, was added as a co-director. 
together, the duo turned to live action films for research, particularly those by directors Orson Welles, Alfred Hitchcock, and David Lean, desiring to bring great cinematic techniques to their film as opposed to just great animation techniques. I've always found this to be a pretty smart technique because, of course, there's a ton you can learn from watching other animated films, but especially during this time period, Disney was out to create great films, not just great animated films. And what better way to do that than by studying some of the great live action directors as well? But the biggest element that would set the look and feel of the rescuers down under apart from other Disney animated films was the usage of CAPS, the Computer Animation Production System. Back in the mid-80s, a little independent company by the name of Pixar had developed what they called the Pixar Image Computer, a computer that existed to create an aid in high-end visualization for things like medicine and meteorology. Disney, who had been looking more into methods of computer animation, eventually teamed up with Pixar and spent $10 million on Pixar Image Computers alongside custom code written by Pixar in order to help create their CAP system. Now, for the Disney company today, $10 million may seem like chump change, but this was no small investment for the company back in the 80s, especially when you consider that this was an investment that wasn't even guaranteed to bring back a dime. This was a purchase that was done strictly to help make animated movies faster, as well as to help the artists expand what was even possible through animation. The CAP system allowed animators to digitally insert their drawings into the computer in order to be colorized and integrated within the scene. This not only cut down on costs due to a lack of necessity for cell sheets and a dedicated ink and paint process, but also allowed for more advanced animation techniques, such as transparent shading, easier integration of CGI, and a massive overhaul and improvements to multiplane camera shots. Now I know that that may sound like a lot of technical mumbo jumbo, so just to simplify things a bit, the CAP system pretty much took your hand drawings and made them digital. And once they were digital, well, a computer can just do more fancy things than a human can, so it helped elevate these hand drawings to heights that we had never seen before to this point. And in their excitement to use this revolutionary new system, it was decided that the rescues down under would be made entirely using the CAP system, making it the first ever 100% digitally animated film. But before this point, the only usage of the CAP system at the studio was animating Mickey in their magical world of Disney opening and a quick scene from the end of The Little Mermaid, meaning that the 100% usage of CAPs on the rescues down under was actually approved before the system was ever used on a short. Now for those of you who know Disney history, or at least pay attention to my channel, you'll know how highly unusual this order of events is. Even way back in the 30s with the multiplane camera, Disney always used their shorts as a way to test the new animation technology, as a way to work out the kinks, as well as make sure the tech even worked properly before investing a huge animated feature on it. It was a huge risk to jump right into a feature with the cap system, and the staff knew that as well, with producer Tom Schumacher even saying that he was heartbroken that Disney decided to use the cap system on his movie before first testing it out on a short. But although Disney was entering uncharted territory with caps, they also used a fair share of tried and true animation techniques as well. Many of the animators visited Australia to scout and sketch various locations, including the landmarks of Iris Rock and Catherine Gorge, to both get a feel for and learn about the film's setting, but also help gain perspective on the scale between the outback and the protagonists. Back at home, the animators teamed up with the San Diego Zoo in order to study the animals of Australia close up, both traveling to the zoo and having some of the animals brought into the offices. Glenn Keane, who headed the animation on the Eagle Marahute, was actually given a stuffed eagle from the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History in order to better acquaint himself with the ins and outs of the giant bird so that he could animate it more believably. It's actually super fascinating hearing Keen talk about the anatomy of the eagle and equating it to the anatomy of a human. It's a super interesting analogy if you ever get a chance to check it out. Also, is it just me or are these animators just taking advantage of the movie that they're working on to go on cool vacations and play with animals? Or maybe I'm just jealous. I don't know. It's one of the two. The casting was handled slightly different than normal due to the nature of the film being a sequel with returning characters. Critically, both Bob Newhart and Ava Gabor were brought back to voice Bernard and Bianca respectively, but there was a slight issue with their avian companion. In the original film, radio star Jim Jordan was cast as Orville, the albatross who transported Bernard and Bianca on their adventure. 
However, Jordan passed away shortly before casting was complete in 1988, and in response to this, Roy E. Disney decided to write the character of Orville out of the film, instead of replacing him with a new character, his brother, Wilbur, who would be voiced by comedian John Candy. Acclaimed actor George C. Scott was cast as the villain, Percival C. McLeach, but there was also some debate over who should voice the child protagonist in the film, Cody. Storyboard animator Joe Ranft argued that the boy and his actor should be Aboriginal Australian, in keeping with the spirit of the Australian outback, but Katzenberg overruled Ranft, instead opting to make Cody a quote, little white blonde kid, voiced by Norwegian American child actor Adam Ryan. I'll be honest, I kind of disagree with Katzenberg on this one, as I don't think that making the child protagonist Aboriginal Australian would have changed the movie in the slightest, and it actually could have added a little more authenticity and representation. You know, it's interesting, because with the Disney company how it is today, and with how they've casted some recent movies like, say, Moana, if Rescuers Down Under were made today, I have no doubt that Cody would have been an Aboriginal Australian. But with the film's deadline looming and the studio effectively relying on brand new technology to get it done, production began to fall behind. And in order to try and stay on schedule, work began to be outsourced to Disney's MGM studio in Florida in conjunction with the main studio in Glendale. To this point, Disney's MGM Studios had only dealt with shorts and were actually in the process of working on The Prince and the Pauper, the short that would eventually play in theaters ahead of The Rescuers Down Under. But despite this inexperience, drawings and tapes were shipped across the country between the two studios daily, and in the end, MGM Studios contributed about 10 minutes to the 77 minute feature. It really is kinda wild that after the huge success of The Little Mermaid, the Disney company was willing to risk such a leap of faith on both a technology and a studio that were completely untested in features. It really is kinda miraculous that this movie got done at all. I also can't help but wonder how much easier this whole process would have been in today's day and age with things like, you know, cloud storage as opposed to mailing drawings back and forth 3,000 miles across the country. Crazy. But despite all the risk and all the delays, The Rescuers Down Under did meet its deadline and was released in the theaters on November 16th, 1990. Delegates, we have an important announcement. Bernard and I have decided to accept the mission to Australia. Australia. Oh. So The Rescuers Down Under was not only Disney's first animated sequel, but also the first digitally animated film. But how does the movie itself stand up? Analyzing this film is kind of a weird endeavor, at least compared to other Disney films that I've reviewed thus far. In the past, I've compared films to one another, typically with similar themes or settings, as a means of making points or just talking about particular elements about the film that I liked more or less than in previous ventures. But in all those cases, those comparisons were about very specific points, and in this case, we're talking about a sequel, and it's almost impossible to talk about The Rescuers Down Under without having its predecessor at least in the back of your mind. So to actually make this an interesting review to listen to, as opposed to just a comparison of two movies going back and forth, I think that there's two real ways to look at The Rescuers Down Under, on its merits as a standalone film, and how it works as a sequel. So let's start with the former though, because, I don't know, it just seems easier. Let's get one thing straight right off the bat. This film is gorgeous. I truly believe that the animation in this film is its strongest asset, and frankly, I think that Disney knew that too, because there are a ton of long, almost show office shots of the backgrounds that really display what the new cap system could do. I'm sure that some people could find this style of filmmaking a bit pretentious and unnecessary, but in all honesty, I was so captivated by the animation that I didn't even really mind it. The high point of this film's animation though, no pun intended, is the flight animations, and particularly those used during Cody's flight on Marahute. The backgrounds, the almost wordless connection that gets established between the two characters, the dynamic camera moves, it all blends together to create not just an effective opening sequence, but a standalone great scene. Despite it taking place so early in the film, Cody's flight is debatably the most memorable sequence in the entire movie, and I don't say that so much as a knock on the rest of the film, but more so as a glowing endorsement of the scene itself. I'm actually so high on this scene that, as blasphemous as it may sound compared to some of the more classic movies that we've looked at, I think that Cody's flight is the single most impressive animation that we've seen from Disney to this point. Seriously, if you've never seen The Rescuers Down Under, at least look up the intro. The scene is that good. 
and it's always nice to see characters that you enjoy return, in this case Bernard and Bianca. I thought they were one of the high points in the 1977 original, and even something as subtle as having the original voice actors return gives the characters a sense of familiarity with the audience, even if their designs have gotten a massive modernization from the updated animation. And while we're talking about voice actors, I thought that George C. Scott did a great job with the villainous McLeach. He seemed to have a lot of fun with this over-the-top rogue poacher, and something about that gravelly voice of his I thought worked perfectly with this type of character. Though I'll be honest, it did kind of bother me that in a movie that was taking place in Australia that there was really only one main character that had an Australian accent, Jake the Kangaroo Mouse. At least for the characters who were supposed to be from the Outback, I think it would have made a little bit more sense to give them accents that weren't so distinctly American. But unfortunately, for as good as the characters were performed, I did find the characters themselves to be a little bit shallow. Mick Leach, for example, as entertaining as Scott was, his motivations always seemed a bit murky to me. It's implied that he's poaching Marahute because she's valuable, but also because of his sense of pride in taking her down, but neither aspect is really all that explored. Jake, I felt, could have been a more dynamic character, but it felt like he had limited screen time and really only existed as a sort of foil to Bernard. And as for Cody, I ironically felt that the most fun aspect of his character, how capable and thrill-seeking he was, actually made him a tougher fit for a rescuer's movie because he didn't exactly scream protagonist in peril to me. In the first film, Penny was clearly trapped and a very vulnerable character, and even herself was the one to ask to be rescued, so Bernard and Bianca became a very integral part of her story. Cody, on the other hand, though he is in trouble, never to me at least seemed like a helpless character or even all that vulnerable of a character, and his story doesn't even intertwine with the rescuers until the last 10 minutes or so, so there's a little bit more of a disconnect there than in the first movie. Some of these issues of characters not being fleshed out enough probably could have been alleviated with a slightly longer runtime, as clocking in at a brisk 77 minutes, The Rescue's Down Under is actually the shortest of the Renaissance films, or at least it could have made a better usage of that time. There was actually a lot of screen time in the movie dedicated to what could really be described more as entertaining side stories than actual relevance to the main plot. Scenes like Wilbur and the Crazy Doctor, and even Cody and McLeach's jail are certainly fun to watch, and there's nothing inherently bad about these scenes, but after the movie was over, I couldn't help but think about how those scenes kinda weren't necessary to the film as a whole. And look, I'm all for a good side story every now and again, but when those side stories are taking up 10 minutes of a 77 minute film and introducing a bunch of new characters that we don't even really get payoffs to, I mean, we don't even find out if the animals in McLeach's jail get released or not, it does sort of leave you wondering whether or not that time could have been better served elsewhere. Now for how the movie operates as a sequel, I have certain simple standards when it comes to sequels. A bad sequel actually harms the original movie, and a good sequel is a necessary addition to the story of the original. So right off the bat, I don't think this is a bad sequel by any means, because it does stay true to the characters that we come to know and love, and it doesn't undo or nullify any of the events or character arcs of the first film. Now as for if this is a necessary sequel, that's a little bit trickier to unpack. The story and premise of the Rescue 8 Society does lend itself to a sequel, so it's not like adding on to the story of the Rescuers is fitting a square peg into a round hole, which is certainly a good start. But where I hesitate a bit is I'm just not sure if there's enough growth in our returning characters to really call this a necessary sequel. Bernard's character arc is kind of similar to the one he had in the first movie, a timid mouse who tries to find his inner courage, this time manifesting itself as trying to ask Bianca to marry him. Bianca, on the other hand, doesn't really have any discernible change in her character from our last movie. She's still an adventurous, slightly impulsive, flirtatious go-getter. It does sort of leave me conflicted, because while they are staying true to the characters that were established in the first movie, and I appreciate and like that, I just wish I would have seen a little bit of growth from these characters in this movie, just to justify bringing them back, as opposed to just taking those same characters and plopping them into a new environment. But again, that's just my preference. So all in all, where does this leave us with this movie? Well, I think it's fine. 
The animation is out of this world, and the awesome soundtrack I do think covers well for the lack of songs. But the story leaves some to be desired, and as a sequel, though I think it's a perfectly acceptable continuation of The Rescuers, I just don't think it enhances the story or characters enough to deem it as necessary. And at the end of the day, I still think I enjoy the original Rescuers film a little bit more than this one, just purely based on the strength of its story. Ultimately, this is a movie that almost feels like a holdover from the transitional era, and I think if it were released during that time, I probably would look at it as a standout of the era. But unfortunately, with it being part of the renaissance and surrounded by some of the best Disney animated movies of all time, the judgment scale is just a little bit higher than usual, and it's not hard to see why The Rescue's Down Under is typically the forgotten film of the Disney renaissance. If you like The Rescuers or just enjoy pretty animation, then it's certainly worth a watch. Just know going in that it's not exactly on the same level as some of the other classic Disney films from the era. The Rescuers Down Under opened to mixed reviews from the critics, with the more positive ones focusing on the great production value and fantastic animation, and the more negative ones focusing on the weak story. The film also, unfortunately, underperformed at the box office, pulling in $3.5 million in its opening weekend, a far cry from the over $6 million Little Mermaid raked in in its opening weekend, which placed The Rescuers Down Under fourth at the box office in what was a crowded release weekend behind Home Alone, Rocky V, and Child's Play 2. In response to the poor opening weekend, Jeffrey Katzenberg would pull the plug on all television advertising for The Rescuers Down Under. So obviously the problem here was Home Alone, which was a juggernaut at the box office and pulled from that same family demographic. And yes, pulling the advertisements is a bit unusual, but I think that was more of a cutting their losses move than anything else. There have actually been some people who've suggested that Katzenberg actually set up the rescue stand under to fail because he would have known what a hit Home Alone was about to be, but... Quite frankly, I don't think that entirely makes sense or is too fair to him because even the makers of Home Alone, I don't think, knew what a runaway success they were about to have and what would Katzenberg gain exactly from tanking his own movie? Ultimately, the film would pull in $47.9 million worldwide, but the $27.9 million it made domestically wouldn't even make it the highest grossing Disney animated film that year, as a re-release of The Jungle Book would actually outdraw The Rescues Down Under by nearly $17 million. That's pretty rough being outdrawn by a 23-year-old movie, but is it any worse than being outdrawn by Rocky V? Jerry's still out on that one. But despite The Rescuers Down Under being Disney's lowest grossing animated movie of the 90s, there were actually plans for it to get another sequel in 1996. But plans for that and any future Rescuer sequels were cancelled in the wake of Ava Gabor's death in 1995. And although the movie wasn't financially successful, it did open the door for future Disney animated sequels, something that's still in effect to this day. And it was successful as the main theatrical voyage for the Cap system, which would go on to be used in every Disney animated classic but one through 2004. That one exception was Dinosaur, by the way, but we'll cross that bridge another day. And this is a little weird, but the juxtaposition between the success of the musical Little Mermaid and the failure of the non-musical Rescues Down Under might have also suggested to the Disney studio that the public wanted musicals at that time, and that might explain why every other film in the Disney Renaissance is, in fact, a musical. I don't know if that counts as legacy exactly, but it's something worth noting. So in the end, the biggest legacy of The Rescuers Down Under is that of the black sheep of the Renaissance, the sole financial misstep buried in a sea of runaway success. But luckily, there were enough positives, particularly in the animation of The Rescuers Down Under, that proved to be a vital foundation ahead of Disney's most creatively and financially successful decade in their history. Well guys, that'll wrap up for me this week. Hope you all enjoyed, and let me know what your thoughts are on The Rescuers Down Under. 
Also, be sure to follow me on Twitter, at Joe Disney Guy, to keep up to date with myself and my various channels. Check out my Patreon page for some exclusive perks and to find out how you can help support myself and my various channels. Be sure to subscribe to my gaming channel, JTG Gaming. Link for that will be down in the description below, where we have all sorts of gaming stuff, particularly Kingdom Hearts at the moment. And of course, be sure to subscribe to this channel, and if you like this video, check out one of the other fine videos that are floating around my head right now. Thank you all so very much for watching, and I will see you all real soon. Rescuing society, heads held high, touch the sky, you mean it.